say good morning church why don't you stand to your feet there's a lot of crazy going on in our world hey a lot of crazy a lot of crazy I could say two things as we're in this room this morning first thing I could say is well let's just forget about all that come in here and worship God that's all right the second thing I could say is okay let's acknowledge what's going on in the world and then let's acknowledge the solution because let me read this to you this is not a passage of scripture we normally hear at this time of year but it's from Isaiah 9 it says for a child is born to us a son is given the government will rest on his shoulders he will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father and Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. If there's four things this world right, needs right now, it's a wonderful counsellor. It's someone to bring counsel. And I believe it's our responsibility as the church of God to be a people that don't just retreat to four walls of a building when chaos is reigning and say, okay, I get to worship God, isn't it great? But there is a time we have here in this place right now where we get to receive, where God will pour His goodness, His mercy and His counsel into His people so that through us, this world will hear the wisdom of a wonderful counsellor. This world needs a mighty God. They need to see the evidence of a mighty God. Evidence is talked about through this thing of our testimony the things that we encounter here the life-changing experiences the healings that happen bring a testimony that prove that our God is mighty we see this world needs an everlasting father truth that was true back then that is true right now and true into eternity the words that he speaks carry weight but what this world needs most right now is a Prince of Peace. Yes. A Prince of Peace, and that is our Jesus. That was what was prophesied thousands of years before He came and is still so true thousands of years since He rose from the grave. That's right. Father God, we just thank You that in this room today, we don't just come to forget about what's going on in our world. We don't just come to put those things out of our mind. But Father, we come to bow down to You and not bow down to it. And Lord God, I just thank You that in this room today, by the power of Your Spirit, You will pour out such a goodness, such a glory from heaven that every need will be met, every fear will be erased, Lord God through the love of God, the everlasting love of God. Holy Spirit, I thank You right now that You are just bringing back to life dreams that have been put aside that many would want to see the year 2020 as a wasted year. But Father, we see it as a year where dreams were rebirthed, where Father, prophetic words came to fruition. Father God, this year has six months remaining. Lord God, we will not let the enemy take those as well. Yeah. Father, right now I prophesy into the atmosphere of this room there to be a life, a life more abundantly, God. Father, You came to give life. And we lay hold of that right now, here this morning. Father, as we lift up a shout of praise, as we bring glory to Your Name, Lord God. Father, that has to be the overriding. It has to be God. It has to be God. Church, I want you to get loud. Come on, be in agreement. Be in agreement. Almighty God, just have Your way. Come on. Come on. There's no fear in love, no need to cover up. It's your life in us that made us free. Come on, declare that again. There's no fear in love, no need to cover up. It's your life in us. 
that made us free. Come on, declare today, you make us free. Come on, has he made you free today? You make us free. Your spirit is upon me. You have, you have anointed me to sing to the broken and the lame. That's what we're called to do, church. That life is more than any chain. The world will never be the same in you. We are changed. There's no fear in us. No need to cover up. It's your life in us that made us free. Yeah. There's no fear in love. No need to cover up. It's your life in us that made us free. Come on, declare you make. You make us free. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You make us free. Oh, yes. Come on, let's sing this out again. Your spirit is upon me. You have anointed. You have anointed me to sing to the broken and the lame. Oh, we're going to clear this over our region. That life is more than any chain. The world will never be the same in you. We are changed. There's no fear in love. No need to cover up. It's your life in us that made us free. Oh, say, there's no fear in love. No need to cover up. It's your life in us that made us free. Free. Come on, has he set you free in this place? Yes, you make us free. Yes, you do, Lord. Oh, you make us free. Come on and give him some praise today. today that the world needs to hear that very thing that there is no fear in love there's no reason to, there's absolutely no reason that they have to cover up to feel ashamed or anything right now how many of you all remember the day whenever you were plunged in the river and you remember what that holy water felt like today oh come on we're going to baptize some people here let's just celebrate the lord today like the sound of a symphony to my ears it's like holy water on my skin come on now dead men walking slave to sin I want to know about being born again Oh God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under baptized. I need you. Oh God, I need you. Come on, say, 
You're glad to be in the house of the Lord with them. Wave at them if you're socially distant with them. Love on them. And you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, are you glad to be here? Say amen. amen. Oh, it's such an amazing time to be in the house of the Lord. If you want to get baptized, we got fresh water. <laughs> I was under the pressure. Somebody was getting dunked today. So, oh, are you? I'm just so thankful for what God's doing in this place today. I'm so glad you're here. And um, I want to just let you guys know. So, just thank you so much for being respectful. Of I know there's uh, our security team does such a great job. Our welcome team does such an amazing job. And thank you all for being respectful of each other uh, with this whole the mask, no mask, all that kind of thing. We won't go into all of that. But thank you so much for just your love and respect through this time. I'm thankful to be in the house of the Lord today. Sunday is one of my favorite days. Amen. Oh, I'm so thankful today that uh, Pastor Kevin's going to bring a word. The 9 a.m. was absolutely incredible. It was amazing to get to hear what the Lord was speaking. And he's going to do this. He's going to continue to speak and speak in so many ways. Um, today, though, before Pastor Kevin comes, we do want to have some more worship as well. And that song charges me up every single time. And I'm so thankful what God's going to continue to do in this service. Before we go forward, though, we do want to receive our tithe and offering. And today, I want to kind of, we are actually going to receive it this morning. And here's how we're going to do this, though. Thank you all again for being so patient as we kind of navigate this ourselves as a church of how do we do that. Over the last few weeks, I'll tell you kind of why we're uh, going to receive it this way. And I want to go ahead and invite our, uh, our, our stewardship team to come on up and take your place. And what we're going to do, the reason we've done this is over the last few weeks, we've been doing it at the exits and then we've had the boxes on the tables. Uh, but then it never fails after every service. We've had a few people come up saying, I didn't see so-and-so. Here's my tithe and offering. I didn't see this or I, I didn't get this in. And that's completely okay. So we wanted to make it a little bit more, um, a little bit more accessible. And also, I uh, think, again, as we're kind of figuring this out ourselves, 
Uh, we want to do this a little bit different, though, today that I believe is going to be a powerful moment as well. So what we're going to do is uh, we will here in just a moment, I'm going to tell you about a couple things, and then we're going to stand our feet, and you are going to actually be able to bring your offering down to one of these gentlemen that are here with this offering basket. Now, here's the thing. These gentlemen are not just here as ushers, and, and they've, they've got the offering here. That's not why these gentlemen are here. These are gentlemen that believe that this is a portal and a gateway because I know in my own personal life financially, when I gave my finances to the Lord, He began to do things with them that I could never ever do on my own. And there are things in my life, and I don't give because of that, that's not the reason. But I partnered with heaven and I gave into Him. So we don't give into a building, however, we are. if you are a member here at Expression Church, give. It's one of those things that if you feed from something, feed into whatever is feeding you. And I want to encourage you too, if you are visiting from another church, and maybe you're just here for the day, we're so thankful you're here. But get plugged into your church and give. Because there's so many great things that can happen when we give into the storehouse that God has given to us to be a part of. So... There's still a few ways that you can give, and there's easy ways. There's offering envelopes underneath of every chair. Every chair's been sanitized, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Make your checks payable to ECH, and then if you're giving cash, put that in there. Write your name on it. And then here in just a moment, I'll, uh, we'll be able to come forward and give. And then um, also there is text giving still. You can still do that. That's 84321. You just dial that number. Send a text message to that phone number and in the message body type the numerical value of however much you'd like to give and then you hit send it'll walk you through the process that is an easy secure way of giving uh, but today specifically if you're going to give this way these gentlemen believe in giving amen all these gentlemen they believe in these are portals these are a moment of agreement with all of the kingdom of God so today um, I want to tell you very quickly about two announcements. Then we're going to stand to our feet. You're going to be able to give in the offering today. Very quickly, we have a three-on-three -three basketball tournament coming up August 1st. That is going to benefit the Expression Student Ministry. That's August 1st. If you want to register, by all means, come see myself today. And Pastor Michael Rousey um, will definitely be a part of that. And Stacy, are you a part of that as well? They come see you too. If it's basketball, come see Stacy. So if you have any questions about that, we've got that going on. Then here's another thing. August 4th, we have our ladies' ministry is going to begin the Bible study again. And what this time is, is we had it before, during the, before the pandemic. And then we're going to start it back up, though. And Pastor Pam Tufts, if you want any information about this, it's starting up on August 4th at 6 p.m., and it will be socially distant. We'll be here in the sanctuary. It's going to be a great study. That's for every lady in here. If you want to be a part of that, you can come see myself or Pastor Pam Tufts. And we'll be glad to get you. But there she is. Smiling wave, Pam. There she is. So if you'd like any information, you can come see her today during this time. All right. Are you ready to give this morning? Now that we know everything that's going on, if you're ready to give, say amen. 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 Let's stand to our feet as we bless our offering this morning. Father, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you, Lord, that you are a provider in the midst of any situation. And God, I thank you, thank you today that you have never, ever failed. You have never, ever lost. And so, God, I am just so thrilled today to get to join with my brothers and sisters, Lord, as we begin to press our hearts deeper into worship, Father, through giving. God, we just bless you in this place. And we, as we bring our offerings into this storehouse, God. I pray you continue to steward and teach us, Lord, strategies from heaven that only you can do. We thank you and we give cheerfully, we give unbegrudgingly, and we give into you because you've been so good. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Remain standing. You can bring your offering to one of these gentlemen here if you'd like to, and you can just remain standing as we continue into worship. Thank the Lord today. Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. 
your hand is moving right now you are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus and your voice is calling me out and right now I know you're able a battle no you never lost a battle and I know I know you never will how many of you all that's your testimony this morning oh yes everything's possible by the power of the Holy Ghost a new wind is blowing right now breaking my heart of stone Take it over like it's Jericho And my walls are all crashing down And right now I know you're able the battle You've never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle. And you never will. Come on, declare that today. You've never lost a battle. Come on, testify. You've never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle. No, 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 no. Never lost a battle. No. Thank you, Lord, you've never lost a battle. I'm here today because you've never lost a battle. You can do all, you can do all things. You can do all things but fail. Cause you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. a battle in your life this morning. Come on, all those times whenever you were down and out in those moments, whenever you didn't know what was going to happen on the left or on the right, he was still right there. Aren't you thankful for him today? You've never lost a battle. Oh, just declare it to him. You've never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle, no. You never will. You never will. You've never lost a battle. 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 You never will. You never will. Come on, say, you've never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle. 
you never will. Come on, if you know it's true, come on, say, you've never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle. No, no. You've never lost a battle. No. Come on, somebody testify of his goodness today. Oh, you've never lost a battle, no. You can do all things, yes. You can do all things. You can do all things, but fail. Cause you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. And I know, I know, you never will. Oh, you can, you can do all things. You can do all things, but fail. Cause you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. And I know, I know, you never will. Come on, say. I know, I know, you never will. I know, I know, you never will. Yes. Come on and give him a praise today.
anticipation We await the promise to come Everything that you have spoken Will come to pass Let it be done
worthy and worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You love us. Oh, how you love us. Oh, how you love us, Jesus. So great a love. So great a love. our hands in the air. The Craig and the band still playing. Just continue to lift your hands. Just take a moment. I know we've been blessed by Chris. We're hearing Ruth and Steph and the rest of them sing. Pam, all the rest of them, Brendan are singing. I just really want for the next 30 seconds or so that something to come from your heart. Make a joyful noise. It's just something that comes from you. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of you shall flow. We've heard it flowing out of them. Let's just hear it flowing out of you. You have an audience of one. That's him. You're not singing for people around you. You're worshiping the Lord. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're not trying to hit the right note, you're just trying to hit a note. You're not trying to hit the best note, you're not trying to impress, he's already impressed.
says that she just keeps feeling this impression that there's somebody up here that has just a flooding of emotions that are just flowing over top of them right now. They're just encapsulating their whole body. If uh, that's you this morning and you need prayer, then I want you to step out of your seat. Just come up here and Diane's going to pray for you right here. If you just feel over emotions right there. Close my eyes and that's like they're saying and a flood hit me. One minute I was happy, one minute I was sad, the next minute I was screaming, oh God, God, where are you? This isn't me, I don't come up on this stage. I don't know who you are, but I'll pray for you. He's right there. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> say it. There's two things that just happened just now. Okay? One, that the church had a word. Right? The second one was the one that she needed to pray for was right in front of her face. Yes. Do you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes we're looking out here yeah. when they've already walked right in front of us. I'm not saying that to her because she hears from the Lord all the time. Right? She heard from God. He needed to pray. To be prayed for it. I'm just encouraging you this morning that you think what you're carrying is for somebody way out there and maybe you're not being recognized or maybe you're not being fit you're where you're supposed to be. I'm telling you that what God equips you with, he will bring right in front of you. That's right. You don't have to go looking for it. It's right in front of you. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? Sometimes we're looking beyond and you are a solution to somebody's need right here in front of you. Because she's not the type that would come up on the platform and talk. It's just not her personality. Right? It's just not. But she hears from the Lord. And she heard from the Lord. And some of you think, well, I don't know that I hear from God. Yes, you do hear from the Lord. You do hear from God. God speaks to his children. God speaks to his people. His sheep know his voice and a stranger they won't shut the follow. So you hear his voice. You may not understand sometimes the application of that voice, but I'm telling you, you hear his voice. You do. Who in here has trouble hearing the voice of God? If that's you, raise your hand. You just feel like you have trouble hearing the voice of God. It's okay. We've all been there. I'm there sometimes too. Who, anybody else? I'm gonna pray right now that your ears, your de the deafness of your ears open up. Father, in Jesus' name, the spiritual deafness that we sometimes experience and not hearing your voice or thinking we're not hearing your voice, I open up those ears right now. Loose them and give them a confidence and a boldness, a courage to know that they have heard your voice and to walk forward with the voice that they hear. Take away the mystery of it, take away the uncertainty of it, and give them the courage, the strength, the knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt, they heard your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys. You guys can be seated. time, uh, I made me think of Diane when she said prayer today, it was a time, um, it was a little, I was trying to figure out where to go, I was preaching at this big place, and there was lots of people, and a big kind of a, a auditorium place, and when we got there, they, were, they said there'd be somebody there to give you some instruction where to go, and uh, as I walked in the place, I didn't see, I was looking for somebody that could, ident I could identify and as I walked in the, the auditorium, we were standing there for a few minutes, and a little kid came running up, probably five, six years old, and the little fella came running up, and he was pulling up my pants leg. He was just pulling, and I said, hey, how are you? Nice to meet you, and I was patting on the head, and just giving him some uh, attention right there, and he was pulling at me, and pulling at me, and I, I kept looking uh, for where to go, and I didn't know where to go. So, gosh, minutes were going by, and we were trying to figure out where to go, and this little fella was still standing there, pulling up my leg, and... 
finally, around the corner, a guy came. He goes, are you, you ready? You ready? You ready? It's time. It's time. We got to go. We got to go. I said, yeah. He goes, did, did you not go with him? And I thought, I was looking for something, and it came in a different package. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes we're looking over here, and God sends it in a form you didn't expect. Right? So always look and be attentive to the little things as well, because God speaks. Amen? Sometimes you can't see in front of you for what you see out there. That was a great illustration today. Incredible. And I thank God we have people like her to hear the voice of God in the church. Aren't you? Yes. Stacy needed prayer today. She heard that. He could have left here today without any prayer if she had to be obedient to what God told her to do. Thanks, Diana. Appreciate that. It's good. It's good to be around people that hear the voice of the Lord. Speaking of hearing the voice of the Lord, I just did. We're going to receive communion next week. We're going to drink from the same cup and eat from the same loaf of bread. (laughs) Not really. (laughs) But we're going to receive communion. I just heard the Lord and I was standing back there and I came up here and it came back to my mind that um, when Jesus first, the first miracle that Jesus performed was at the wedding, uh, Cana, Cana of wedding, the wedding at the Cana of Galilee. And he was there with a group of people that he, and his disciples. His mother was there. And he had not performed any miracles at that point. And while he was there, um, the wine had run out. And it, it had all become watered down. And his, the, the people come up to him and said, look, the water's, the wine is gone, told the mother. And the mother looks at Jesus and says, the, you know, water, wine's gone, so you're going to have to do something. And Jesus looked at her and said, it's, it's not, my hour has not yet come. It's not time for me yet. And she looks back at him and she says, well, okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> but then she looks at the servants and she says, whatever he tells you to do, do. And Jesus is the word. So what that basically is saying is, in application to us, is whatever the word says to do, do it. The word is in season and out of season. You can place a demand on the word. And the word has to work. Jesus looked at his mom and said, it's not for me. Now, most of us today would probably put him in time out. He's, he's back talking, didn't, didn't, didn't do it. The servants went up to him. Jesus says, give me six water pots of stone. And he turns the water into wine, the new wine. Jesus is the author of the new wine. When the high priest in the Old Testament, this is going to be for somebody, some of you are not going to get this, I'm sure, but the Old Testament, the high priest, the, when the priest would deliver sacrifice bread on the, in the tabernacle, when Melchizedek, which was the, the priest that has no beginning and no end, Melchizedek served communion to Abraham after Abraham had just won a big battle. And he brought him bread and wine. And the Lord spoke to me back there and said, it is time for us to serve the new wine with the new bread and the new wine, and that being a ceremonial aspect of it but doing it in the way as we're ushering in something of the spirit that the world and the church has not seen. And so we're going to receive, I don't even know how we have all the, we have stuff. We will receive this somehow next week. I don't know how we're going to do it yet, but we'll work out all the details between now and next Sunday. Okay. So come next week. And I know what some of you are thinking, and I've, because I've preached this before, uh, in times past, you know, I, I can't take communion because I got stuff in my life and I'm not worthy to take communion. I just got news for you. If you are holy and perfect and you can receive communion because you're holy and perfect, we would just as soon eat your bread and wine because you're by yourself. All right? So the blood of Jesus is in the, the body of Jesus, the bread, the broken body of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus is not for the perfect. It's for the one that needs the perfection from him. Are you hearing me? Jesus had the disciples in an upper room, and they had the Last Supper. They, they had a form of communion. And I was taught, I even preached early on in my ministry, 
that you better make sure you've got it all together. And if you've got any unconfessed sin in your life, and you take this communion, you just, or, or you just damned your soul. Until I realized one day that Jesus gave the communion the first time in the upper room with all 12 disciples. And he hadn't even died yet. So how were they able to receive communion with him not even yet dying? And then I began to dig a little deeper, dig a little deeper, and I found out that G Judas took communion. Yeah, Peter took communion. And Peter denied him, cussed three, denied him three times and cussed him out and cussed everybody else out too. He had a foul mouth, potty mouth, Peter. But you see what I'm saying? Peter needed it, communion. So we receive communion because he's worthy. And it brings us into fellowship with him because of his faithfulness and his worthy, not us. We don't take communion based on our good. We take communion based on his good, right? So next week, we're going to receive communion because he's good and his mercy endures forever. And the reason he does it in the book of Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, they were building the wall back when they were coming out of Babylon. I'm, I'm all over the Bible this morning. I'm not even in a sermon yet. But they were building, the, the place was crazy. It was wild. They were, the, the world was falling apart. Children of Israel were starting to build back the temple and laying the foundation. And right in the middle of all the chaos, Sanballat, all these people started coming against them, telling them they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, there, were, there was riots. There, were, there, was, there was looting. There was all kinds of things happening in that day, just similar today. And Nehemiah and Ezra said, I'm not coming down from this wall. I got a mission to accomplish. And then they stopped and they sang and he put the psalmist and the minstrels in front of everybody and they said, they begin to sing a song that says, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. There's going to have to be a sound that will come out of this house and out of our people and out of the body of Christ in the midst of all this chaos that we're experiencing all across the world, in the cities and regions around us even particularly, there has to be a sound that comes from the church, from the people of God that says the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. In the midst of it all, there's got to be a voice. There's got to be a people. There's got to be a group that says the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. I believe that's us. I believe that's you. I believe in the midst of trials and tribulations and turbulence all around you, your life, when the bottom is falling out from underneath you, the rug is pulled out from underneath your feet, when things are just spinning out of control and you can't explain them, you've got to be able to look right in the middle into your circumstances and say the Lord is good and his mercy endures endures forever. You can't pay the bills. You're, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Your body is hurting and the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. If your marriages are falling apart, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Your kids don't they turn on you. You can't see them. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. You can't explain what you just happened to you and your loss that just happened. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Your emotions are high, your emotions are low, but the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. When it all is said and done, there'll be more that's said than there is done. But his, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. When I was a young guy playing ball, and I played up until uh, playing Little League. Little League in our, my day went up to 12 years old, and once you became 13, 14, and 15, you played Senior League. And when I was a little guy in the Little League, Little League couldn't, still, couldn't lead off and the only time you could steal a base was um, when it was a, you know, the ball had to pass the, the, uh, the batter. When the pitcher pitches the ball, has to pass the batter. Once it gets past the batter, you can run all you want to. But, of course, unless there's a pass ball, nobody had the speed to run because you were stuck on the base, right? So there was no leadoff. There was none of that when we played in 12, when we were 12. So we were conditioned from a little guy all the way up from T-ball all the way up through Little League that you did not, your foot had to be on the base. If you lead off and the kid hits the ball and you're off that bag when he hits the ball, you, you, you can't, it's a disqualify, you're disqualified, you can't, you'll be out, right? That's how we were taught. That's how the rule was, little league rule. I get to 13 and I come into the 13 year old and we sit down with the coach and the coach finally looks at us and says, I know all the way up through little league you've been taught that you could not lead off or steal a base until the batter, the ball passes the batter. That's what he said. He said, but I'm going to introduce something to you that is going to change the way you play baseball. You now can lead off at 13. It's perfectly legal to lead off. Well, 
for a long time, as a 13-year-old, we learned that that's possible. But a lead-off to us was taking like two or three inches off the base. Because we were afraid. We were conditioned not to lead off. Right? So we had to learn how to take the risk, and it was really okay for us to do that. And the, if you were a speedster, you'd take off a bigger lead. If you were smaller or you couldn't move as fast, you would stay closer to the base, and the coach would make you. But you had to be trained. So the coach had to sit us down and say, these were the rules when you played Little League. But everything you've been taught has been right. But I'm going to give you something new for the next three years that you're going to be able to do as 13, 14, or 15-year-olds that you couldn't be able to do before. When Jesus came on the scene and he preached the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, starting about 20, verse 21, Jesus had a bunch of people gathered around him. And as Jesus was gathered around all these people, there were people that were following him as his disciples. There were people that were there just for the food and because he could perform a miracle. There were people that were there because they heard, wanted to hear him teach. Other people wanted to trip him up and see if he was just making a mistake and going to say something he shouldn't have said. Others hated him. Some was just curious. Some were not curious. So you had all kinds of an eclectic group of people that were gathered around him for every kind of motivation that you could possibly imagine. And then Jesus begins to introduce to them something that they had not heard before. He began to say things like this, I know you've heard before such and such, but I tell you this. What? I know you heard this, but I tell you this. And he did it all through Matthew, about Matthew 5, 21, up until he got to a certain section of a, a time in his Sermon on the Mount. And people were going, now I want you to think about this, because he's telling them, you have been for 4,000 years hearing it one way. You have been taught, you've been handed it down, and everything you've been taught is exactly the way you've been taught, because somebody taught you firsthand, and they said this is the way. But I'm going to tell you, even though you've heard it that way, I'll say to you that it almost sounded like he was changing something. But he wasn't changing something. He was giving them instruction because there it was a time where time and people had matured to a place and life had matured to a place and he was ushering in a new covenant, a new relationship. Jesus had come to eliminate the mystery that they all had for 4,000 years. For 4,000 years, people wondered what God thought and they had to rely on a human being that was just like them, that made mistakes just like them that had come down and said things and told about God, and they would go, well, and as long as Israel had a king that was good, they were blessed. If they had a king that wasn't good, they would not be blessed. So they were up and down. They had peaks and valleys. They had all types of lifestyles, and things were good sometimes, and for seasons they were not good. And the, the children of Israel always had this suspect of wondering what God was like. And there was the authorities that taught the, the, the law, or the, they taught, the, the, the rabbis taught. They thought it was this perfect theology that they thought they had because they had the rules. All these things were wonderful. And then Jesus comes on the scene and says, here's what I'm going to do. I know you have thought it's been this way, but I'm going to show you the intent and I'm going to, I'm going to completely eliminate the mystery of what God really thinks. And I'm going to make it plain to you. Not only am I going to tell you, I'm going to explain to you and I'm going to show you by demonstration how God really thinks towards people. So you just have to listen to me. You just have to watch me. You just have to come follow me. And I'm going to change your perception. I'm going to give you a lens to see life through that's going to forever change the way you see yourself, the way you see God, and the way you see people. That was Jesus' message. He said, it's going to be very simple. I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of confuse everybody. I'm just going to come down here and whatever you, just to tell you and show you how it really is. So when Jesus began to show that message and demonstrate that message in Matthew 5, he takes them there and he says, I know you heard this way. But here's what I'm telling you. And he spoke with such authority that people begin to say, who does he think he is? Some thought he was God. Some thought he was from heaven. Some thought he was just another man that was a false prophet. There was so many different opinions of who he was. The only thing that really had them in a, in a quandary was the fact that what Jesus would bring evidence of the message that he spoke, he would begin to do things perform miracles, perform signs, perform signs, perform wonders in the very midst, and he would begin to show them, and God would validate his message and his teachings with those signs where people couldn't deny it if they even wanted to. 
Even if they tried to, if they say, well, no, that's not what the Torah says, that's not what the, the law says, that's not what, and they would, how could they deny the fact that the guy whose eyes were opened that was once blind? They couldn't explain it. You can't explain the evidences, but Jesus would come and begin to teach them because people like to get in debates and arguments with you. If you look at our society today and the culture that we live in, it doesn't take long to figure it out that every system of structure of society is right now being pressed to its very core. From technology, media, um, sports and entertainment, to education, to business and economics, uh, family, every aspect of life right now is being pushed on at its very core. For some reason, the church thinks we're out here watching everybody else get pushed on. We, we feel exempt because we're out here. We're, we're the church. We're God's people. So we hope economics gets pushed. We hope the political government, politics and government gets pushed. We hope the education gets pushed because we see all the, fa fail, uh, frail, uh, the failures and the you know, frailties in all of those situations and such systems. So we're over here looking at all them going, well, they're just getting what they deserve because they're demonic. They're, demonic. they're, just, they get, they're just getting what they, look at them. I don't know what we're going to do with education. I don't know if we're going to, and then everybody's got an opinion of what they think the best way to fix it. Everybody's got an opinion. But the church is over here going, yeah, we just, we become opinionated and commentary just like the world. So we're over here thinking that we're going to be exempt and the church is going to be exempt. And the, if we think for one minute, the, the, the biggest stress we're going to face is do we do it online or in service, we're out of our mind. Don't think for one minute that the church structure as we know it is under the same kind of pressure. Because we're coming to a place where the church better sh put up yeah. Yeah. Right. or shut up. Right. It isn't going to be the fog lights. Craig Nobles, man, incredible piano player. We got, and you got Matt Hale and all those people that, that are part of our church that are not here, but Craig's coming in and just filling in. And I hope he don't fill in. I hope he's permanent now. But Craig's an amazing piano player. But as good as Craig is... As good as Matt is, as good as these people are that we have here on the, 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 there's a ton of them. As good as they are, as good as they are, without the evidences of why they do what they do, we're just another good social program. Right? Little League's getting pressed. Nobody, everybody's, want, I, I turned on Major League Baseball this weekend. I turned it on. There's nobody in the stands, and all of a sudden, right behind the batter is some, some cartoon characters. And I'm, uh, Caden's sitting there watching with me, and he said, those are, those are, those are, uh, those are um, paper figures. He said, those are cardboard. I promise you. Someone, I said, no, that's got to be a part of the technology they put behind there. All the while, we're listening and hearing, <sighs> somebody made a bad call at first base, and we had... Fake booze. Did you all see that? Ooh, you're going, man, and I'm, I'm finding myself getting in. I'm going, man, that was a bad call. Kane's going, yeah, and I'm going, wait a minute. We just joined in with the fake booers. <laughs> They're booing. There's nobody even in the stands. They've got a tech, they've got a machine that's got the sound working, right? Right? Do we need a, we should get some, fa some fake applause. Right? Our smoke detector, our smoke whatever, our keyboard, our screens, we got all, and everybody needs those wonderful things. We could put some fake cardboard people in the box and talk to you and have clapping and go, can I be honest with you? It already happens. We, we do an international television program every week, every Friday. It's played on Impact TV. It goes to 88 million homes across the country. And I've been in some of those studios where I've hosted some of those programs. <laughs> We're probably going to get off TV forever now. <laughs> I've hosted some of those programs. And there's three people in the studio. But you hear a, a clap machine that's making it sound full. Why? Because we're doing it for the benefit of the people. Yeah. We've, we've learned to move the emotions of people. Listen, 
It's in the scripture. Jesus did it. When Jesus fed the 5,000 people, he got his disciples over to the side and he says, look, when we come out of this huddle, I need you to be as loud as you possibly can. I need you to worship me as loud as you possibly can because I need those 5,000 people following us because I'm going to receive an offering here in a few minutes. Do you think he did that? No, he didn't do that. He didn't do anything to get a response because Jesus is a response. Jesus fit the, bit the need of the people. I'm just telling you, when he came to, he wasn't trying to draw a crowd. He, 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 did, he didn't. In fact, they were walking away from him because he said, eat of my body and drink of my blood. That's not a good message. You know what I'm saying? You can't put that on a t-shirt. It's not, he didn't have merch. We have merch. Nothing wrong with all those things, but those things can't be the replacement of the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When Jesus came and he began to speak that message in Matthew chapter 5, he said, you have heard it said this, but I tell you this. When he gets to Matthew chapter 5 verse 38, he says this. You have heard that I have, it, it had been said. You've heard it's been said. In other words, everything you've heard, I want to challenge something that you've heard. You, you said it was this way, but it really is something else. You've heard it been said that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Right? That's why they would fight. They would stand off and fight. Jesus comes and gives them this message. He says, but I say unto you. It's almost like for 4,000 years they've heard it one way and Jesus is coming and changing their theology. That's not what he was doing. He was giving them the understanding of how they had taken their theology and made it where it didn't have any power. He says, but I say unto you that you resist not evil, but, what's, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn him to the other also. So we have taken that scripture right there. Turn to him and do the other also. We have taken that scripture and we have made most churches, most people, most Christians, most religious people, p- people that follow Christ, we have taken it, instead of making them meek, we have made us weak. We've made us timid. We've become passive. So all we really have to offer the world is, that's shameful. Don't do that. You shouldn't do that. Don't, that that's awful. Don't do that. You, you, are you kidding me? We become nothing more than arm court, uh, quarterbacks. Armchair quarterbacks, Monday morning quarterbacks, wondering what should happen. We, we're not in the game. We're not, we're not in the game because we've taken it. And then we come to, we come to church. Guys don't, guy guys don't want to come to church. We've effeminized the body. Here's what we do. I grew up this way. I grew up in church. I was a jock. I'm still a jock. I, I don't look like a jock, but I'm still a jock. All right? <laughs> so, and, and I like to hang around people that like sports. I'm just that, I'm just that way. But I go, we go to church, and the preacher says, grab the hand of your neighbor. And it's a guy. Okay? And I'm going, all right? So he says, cry out to God. Cry out to God? Cry, cr- come on, cry out to God. You got to get in touch with your sensitive side. No. We've, we've, we've made it weak. Right? If he would have said, Be- beat your chest to God, I might have done that. But, um, but, but, but meet me where I'm at. And unless a person has come to the point where they have been broken and they've gotten flushed out of them all of their pride, ain't no guy going to cry out to God. Because gu- guys do what guys do. We want to fix it. We want to put it in, take it in our hand, own hands and, 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 and st- you know, strap up and ready to go. But no, we come to church and, we, and, and we, we can't talk about sports. You couldn't play them when I grew up. You couldn't watch TV. All you could do was things that, and, and, we, and so a whole generation of people have been raised up where church wasn't really guy. It was, you went because your wife told you to, or you went because your girls were there. That's what I did in youth. You know, I didn't go for God. I went because it was a place to go. So we grew up with, I'm telling you, many churches were heavily in women, with women, and guys were not going. Now, we're seeing a shift in that. I don't know if you all know this, but statistics are showing a, sh- a shift because it has started to change. But, but here's what I'm trying to We've become passive, and the church has become passive. And we don't need to be passive. We become timid. Instead of being meek, we have become weak because we say, turn the other cheek. That's not what he's saying here. 
I'll show you. Next verse. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So what do we do? Somebody comes aggressively at you, false accusations, bringing the law against you, to trying to take your cloak of, right, of righteousness. They want you to defend yourself. They start accusations, judgment, critic, criticism, all coming at you. And rather than and, and feel like you have a right to, to, to step up, we just take it. Because what we feel like to do, hold your peace, hold your, so they keep telling, the world keeps telling us how bad we are. Governor Bashir said, let's just, let's just take off church for the next two weeks just to get this thing under control. That's what he said last week, yesterday, just take off the next two weeks. California governor shut him down, all right? So if they start, here's the, here's the, here's the battle, internal battle. Do we file suit? Do we go to court? Do we get, well, no, we just need to, we need to follow suit and just be a good neighbor and be a good steward over what God's told us because we've got to follow man's laws. And we got, all those things are true. It's been said that you do that. But I tell you, how long will you be pushed over? <laughs> it's like we're starting to riot, isn't it? No. And take away thy coat and let him have the cloak too. In other words, go ahead, just, just go ahead and let him have that too. We'll, we'll, God's got our back. Just turn, how about this one? Just turn it over to the Lord. Well, I don't think the Lord wants it. Next verse. And whosoever shall compel thee to go one mile, go with them too. <laughs> Let's go back to 38 real quick. I'm going to show you three words in these, next, in these past three scriptures. I want to show you. You have heard that I have been, it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. First thing Jesus tells them, this is what it says, but here's what you need to do. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. Don't you dare resist evil. Don't you get passive with evil. Don't you, don't you, don't you sit back and wait on things to happen because you don't want to rock the boat, don't want to, don't want to cause any problems. Peace at all costs is dangerous. Oh! I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> You have heard it said, but I say to you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn, look at the word, the word's turn. The first thing you have to do when you're coming out of this passivity, when you're coming into this place of we're going to make a difference and change, is you've got to turn to it. Turn to him. Turn to him. Not turn away from him. Turn the other cheek, but you turn to him. You turn to and toward wherever you're going. The church has, we, and I'm not talking, when I say the church, I'm, not, I'm gonna talk about us in just a minute. When I say the church, we're back here and we're making this, you know, observations. Oh gosh, racism is, is horrible. Look at all that that's happening over there. My, that's it, we, we're crying out for justice. We're crying out for all these things. You can cry out all you want to, but as long as you're back here, you ain't doing nothing but crying out. Yeah. The first thing you gotta do is turn to. You're not going to fix Washington, D.C. if you can't fix Fifth Avenue. That's right. That's right. And I'll break it down. If you're not going to fix Fifth Avenue if you can't fix your home. Can I get an amen? amen. And what I say, and the first thing you're going to have to do is, rather than just think it's all going to go away and sweep it under the rug, you've got to turn to it. You've got to turn to it, and you've got to face it and square off with it. Because, listen, depression, anxiety, oppression are bullies, right? They're bullies. Injustice is bully. They'll look at you in the face, you'll look at them in the face, you'll walk away, they stay there. And as you turn your back on them, they encroach and take more of your territory. And before you know it, they've got your kids. Before you know it, they've got your finances. Then they've got your, fa your wife, your, fa your husband. Then the next thing you know, they've got your house, they got everything, and you're boxed in your little prison while you're over here going, God, I need you, God, I need you, God, I need you. God will meet you as you turn. You've heard it said, turn the other cheek. I tell you, turn to him to turn the other cheek. Because you're not coming after him in the flesh. I say him, I'm talking about it. You're not coming after it in the flesh. You're coming after it in the spirit. You've got to know who you are and what you're carrying. Are you following me? You've got to be willing. Somebody's got to get a little boldness and courage and say, I'm ready to go forward. This is Jesus speaking. And I know it looks like he's saying, woe is me. But no, man, Jesus was strong. 
He was not a weak man. But I say unto you, resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him, or uh, turn to the other also. Turn. You got to turn. Next verse. And if any man will sue thee at the law and the take of the, give, give him the cloak. You got to be a giver. And I'm not talking about giving of your money. I'm talking about giving of yourself. If it don't cost you time, your gift's not being used. You've got to give yourself. You've got to engage in something. You've got to work on it and work in it at the same time. You've got to give. You've got to give. If you don't give, you're going to get taken from. You have to turn to it. You've got to go towards it. And the next step, you have to go. You have to go with all that's in you. And you don't quit when tough times get tough. You turn, you give yourself, and you go. Now, it's wonderful when Jesus is telling them that story because we're talking about relationships because he says all three of these are t- t- talking about people. If a guy hits you on the cheek, hit him, turn your head and let him hit it on the other cheek. If he t- t- sues you, give him your cloak also. If he wants you to go one mile, go two. Those are great things. But let me tell you what he's really saying inside of this message. He's talking to a person that's dealing with himself. The first thing you're going to have to do is turn and face you. You've got to face you. See, the, the blacks are facing the whites, and the whites are facing the blacks, and the Asians are facing the blacks and the whites, and we've got all this systemic racism. We've got all this stuff that's going on. But, but until whites face whites and blacks face blacks and Asians face Asians, until Hispanics face... Right. Oh, I'll break it down even more. See, that's even better. We like that message. No, until I face me. I can't face you unless I face me. And I've got to come at you with humility because I've got to come at myself with humility. I've got to be able to give myself a pass on some stuff that I'm hard on myself on. See, you thought I was coming at you to change you. Your biggest enemy is not the devil. Your biggest enemy is you. Because the, the, the devil can't create, but he can get you to create. Right. He plants a seed. You take the seed, let it plant. The next thing you know, you've got this whole sequence of events happening in your head that you never come to in real life. And you've got all these actors in your mind because you created a movie. You've got a one-minute movie in your mind that you are just tore up about, and you've got all these people that are in this movie with you in your head, and they're all actors and co-stars. They never even know what's going on in your head but you. And you're hard on yourself because you either do one of two things. You'll make yourself a victim, and then you'll get angry at yourself and down yourself, and you feel like you're no good. Listen to me. Turn the other cheek. Turn the carnal cheek and turn it into the cheek of grace. Give yourself an okay. I'm not, I don't know what you're saying. You mean to tell me you're giving me a license to sin? You're doing it anyway. Nobody calls me on the phone and says, hey, I'm ready to do this. They call me on the phone after they've already done it and ask me to help to get them out of it. If you'd have called me on the front end, I'd have given you permission to do it anyway. And then I told you what you're going to get into and you hopefully wouldn't have done it. <laughs> don't do that. Don't quit. Don't, 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 no, no, no. They put you under the law. Give him your cloak too. When you put yourself under the law... You can't live up underneath the pressure. And when you try to go one mile, go two. Now, it sounds wonderful in Matthew chapter 5, but here's where it gets real practical. Luke chapter 17, Jesus had his disciples around him. This was to everybody in Matthew 5, and they were all confused as we are. I heard it said this, but you tell me this? What? I don't know what you mean. So we become passive because we take that whole turn the other cheek thing out of the way and we take, give the cloak away give, and the go to. So we become all about being timid and we just let the world walk all over us while the church sits back and tries to figure out where they fit. And then we become commentators and spectators and we have all these opinions of what we think it ought to be and nobody changing the world. 
Amen to that. Right? Luke chapter 17, Jesus gathers his disciples together. Then he said, that, then said, he, uh, said he and to the disciples, it is impossible but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Now, now stop right there. Here's where we go wrong. What we do is we forget we're talking to us. And we think everything's about somebody else. So we look at this and we say, it is impossible that offenses come, will come. But woe unto him. So we start looking for the person that brings the offense. Jesus is talking to them. Do you know you're capable of offending yourself? We love it when it's about them. What about when it's about us? Woe unto him that offenses will come. Woe unto them through whom they come. Let's go to the next verse. It, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around the neck and he cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Now, here's what he says. Now, let's take heed to yourself means this. Look at yourself. Take heed to yourself. I know what you're thinking. Everybody, it's... A, it's I know John is going, Peter is the problem, Jesus. He shoots off at the mouth every time you turn around. He, he's going to be the one the offense has come. Peter. Or it could be Judas because Judas is going to betray you. You know how this story goes, right? And so they're all talking amongst themselves going, I wonder who he's talking about that's going to be offended here. Who's going to bring the... Well, and I'm sure they use it against each other because the preachers do it today. You better make sure you don't offend one. You offend one of your brothers, you better go to one of your brothers. The next thing you know, both of you are shaking. And the preacher, the preacher's beating his chest, feel like he's done God's word, and he sits back down while everybody's still under the law, under the attack, under condemnation, under judgment, under criticism. Ain't nobody getting free. We're just trying to do what's right. And then you go do what's right, you still don't feel right. Nothing changes. You just, we, me and him have peace now. We have, we have, we, we have peace. We, we, we're, we're good together. No, you don't. You don't even like him. You did an exercise because somebody told you to do it. it was, you felt like it was right. Right? But no, nothing changed. You don't like him, he don't like you, but we can act like it. So we put on our real mask, come to the church, go through the motions, everybody's happy. We go back to our, our, our houses behind our walls, can't pay the bills, pressures are mounting up, the kids are falling apart, things are crazy. We come out of our isolation on Sunday again, put back on the mask, come back to church, and we act like we like him, but we really don't like him. The preacher preaches a good message. He puts us in condemnation. I repent of a little bit of my things. I'm going through a little bit of the things. I think, well, yeah, I felt good. I did my duty. Obligate. And you know what's happening? They're burning down buildings in Portland. They're burning down buildings in Louisville. They're killing people all over the world while we still have our masks on, have our opinion, opinions, and we're still shouting, racism's terrible. Look at that. Mask, no mask. Educate this way, educate that way. And we're trying to figure it all out. And ain't nobody doing anything. When we're supposed to be the voice of the world, they're supposed to hear what we have to say. But we can't because we don't have any, 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 any courage, any strength. We have opinions, but we're not turning to giving ourselves and going. And Jesus looks at him and says, Take, look at yourself. Before you go look at everybody else, go look at you. Take heed to yourself. If your brother trespasses against him, turn the other cheek. That's not what he said. Give him your cloak. Not there. Says walk one, go two. He says, rebuke him. Aggressively take a stand. That's good. That's good. And if he repent, forgive him. Next verse. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, he, he turns again to him and saying, repent, and you shall what? Forgive him seven times, right? Next verse. And the apostles said to him, increase my faith. How? In the he wasn't talking about faith. He was talking about forgiveness. What's, got, what's faith got to do with it? Faith is everything. Are you following this? He, we're trying to go, okay, we were talking about forgiveness. The, 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 the apostles, could, they knew something we don't get today. They said, increase our faith. Increase our ability to trust what you just said. 
Next verse is the one we hang our hat on as word of faith people. This is what we get our, this is, we, we make a denomination out of this next verse. And the Lord said, if thou have a faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamore tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it shall obey you. And we hang, and that's also in Mark eleven twenty three. 23, we hang our hat on it, it becomes a plaque on our wall and we look at, here, we look at sickness and we say, we look at cancer, we look at poverty, we look at all these things and we're declaring those things and we're declaring those things and we're declaring those things, but we didn't do the prerequisite to declare those things. And the prerequisite to declare those things is take an aggressive stance. to turn to, to give in, and to go. Don't, don't kid yourself to think you can't change it, because you can, and it starts right in your home. It starts with your little ones, sitting them down and explaining to them what life's really all about. Husband and wife is on the same page, sharing a vision that's going somewhere instead of working against one another. Be quick to say you're sorry in your house. And be quick to forgive the sorry in your house. And if you master that, you're increasing your faith. And when you're faithful over little, God will make you ruler over cities. Who's ruling cities today? Rioters. And they're, they're, they're expressing themselves because they're, they're seeing injustice and, 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 and now it's turned into other things. So we got to put our money where our mouth is. We got to put our time where our mouth is. We can't be just a church that talks about it without doing it. You got... CNN, you got Fox News, you got MSNBC, you got all those big ones, and here they are, and, 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 and social media, and all this stuff is happening on social media, and, and, and all the meanwhile, churches have religious programming all across you know, the world. We have a program I mentioned on Friday mornings, Friday afternoons, 88 million homes it goes to all over the world, 88 million homes. So we work hard all week. I don't, but they work hard all week. I just preach up. They work hard because I mess up the sermons and they got to pick and put them together. So they work hard all week on trying to make things happen, to make that program. So we can touch the world. So this week I said, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to take that money that we spend on that program, that money that's been given towards that program, and we're going to buy some commercials on local television and newspaper or whatever. We're going to buy the media, buy the term, buy the thing. And we're going to start turning to, we're going to give in, and we're going to go and take a stand. Rather than feel good about us, that we're on an international television program while we dilute the message, we're going to be very specific and succinct in our target area here. Some people, nobody's, nobody's going on secular television and taking time to go, maybe they are, I don't see them, take secular television and saying, Where's the, where's the voice from the clergy? Where's the voice from the, the people of God? Are, are you following what I'm saying? We, 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 we give opinions. I, I, I get invited to be on all kinds of things. And so I, I become a part of a you know, talk show or a, an opinion. What's your thought? What's your commentary? What's your commentary? What are we doing? What are we doing? What are you doing? What are you doing in your house? What are you doing with your influence that you have? Some of you, you don't realize this. When I says that give yourself, do you realize that God made you alive in 2020? At the age that you are right now, with the maturity level that you are right now, with the problems you have right now, I've had before, and problems we're going to have in a few. Do you know God made you exactly right here 
And he kept you alive. You have breath in your body. You have experiences, whether they be good or whether they be bad or a blended of both. And now you don't think for one minute God kept you alive and put you on this earth knowing in 2020 this pandemic and the whole world was going to be turned upside down and you're here. Do you, do you know, you don't know this. You don't. You've heard it said that we need a government to fix this or we need a stimulus plan to do this. Let me tell you what I say. You're the ram in the thicket and you don't even know it. We're looking, the church is looking for something to happen while all the world is going to crazy this way. The church is waiting for something to come up here and God to rescue it. I'm telling you, you're the ram in the thicket. You, in your area of influence, start where you are and take a step. Don't take 10 steps, take one. Right where you are. And if you despise where you are, there's a pretty good chance God's got you there for a reason. If you're trying to get out of where you are, there's a good chance God's got you there for a reason. If you're trying to bust out of that thing, if you just hate everybody around you because it's wicked and it's dirty, you're not. You're there as a light in the middle of a dark place. And God will bless you right there if you begin to turn to, give yourself into it and go towards it. Right there. And you are, you, you have what it takes God has blessed you with wisdom and understanding. He put a voice of God inside of you. He's changed your life and you have a testimony. You have, you have a, an incredible testimony of what God has done in your life and where he's brought you from and what he's done for you. We have a, 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 an incredible encyclopedia probably or a library full of great stories of what God has done for us. It hadn't all been easy. It hadn't all been roses. But we're here. And I'm, I'm just going to encourage you today. The, the, the place of timidity and the place of weakness that we've relegated our churches into. We've made Jesus weak and not even meaning to. But I got news for you this morning. He's not, neat. He's not weak. He, he's not even going to look like he loses. He wins. He overcomes. You got to realize something. Every husband wants his wife to be all of that. Christ is the groom and we're the bride. And the church right now is frail. God's raising us up, bringing us back into that place of splendor and glory of what he's called us to be. Where you can be who you're supposed to be and be able to express who you're supposed to express. Are you ready for the challenge? I'm not looking for you to pick a fight out there. I'm looking for you to pick a fight in here. I want you to fight your inhibitions, your frailty, your fears, your worries, your anxieties, your concerns. I want you to fight those. I want you to turn to them. I want you to give yourself into them. I want you to go after them, take an aggressive stance, and watch God build your faith. Would you stand with me? Went five minutes over today, but they did sing too long. <laughs> Wasn't it good today? Did this help anybody today? Yes. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that we, we're creating pep rallies and ain't nobody going out and changing the world. I'm all for pep rallies, but somebody's got to go play the game on Friday night. Right? Get everybody excited and get your head beat in. I've been there. I don't like it. Let's take this, let's, let's just take this thing over. We didn't come to fit in. We did come to take it over. Every area of influence you have. So let me pray for you. Father, as I stand here today and I feel like we're at one of those moments that you, did, you took all those people to on the, Mount of, the Sermon of the Mount. You, you brought them all up there and you said, I know you've heard this, but I tell you this. And then you begin to expound on things that we thought we knew. And Father, I think we're in that place again as a church world. We're at a place where we've been just living under assumptions. And now you're coming in bringing some clarity to those assumptions and it's challenging who we are. It's, it's looking us right in the face and we're having some difficulty trying to figure it all out. 
And I'm asking, Lord, that you just raise up a voice full of thunder and lightning, of power. Back it by the the power of the signs and the wonders and the, the demonstrations of heaven. That the world will take note that what we're saying is full of love, full of forgiveness, full of grace, and full of power. It'll confound the wise, but it'll rise up and be the voice that the people want to hear and see change with. So I bless everybody here today. And as we walk out of these doors to face the week, that God, you will give us a revelation and understanding and continue to unpack how to turn to, how to give in and go after, how to take an aggressive stance on all those things that are coming against us personally, that we might build our faith, that we might look at anything that's standing in our way. And because of the grain of mustard seed of faith that we have in our hearts, we'll be able to look at that mountain that seems to be looking right back at our face and cast it into the sea and it has to go and do what we say it to do. And the mountains become valleys. The valleys become mountains, and we just continue to grow with you every step of the way. And I heard the Lord say just now, tell them they can trust what they just heard, and they can trust themselves as they walk out of here, that I will lead them, I will guide them, and I will not make a mistake with them. You can trust him. Take the pressure off of you. And know when the mountain comes in front of you, whenever that comes, when you're ready to give into it, there's a good chance it just falls at your feet. He said, tell them to trust themselves because they can trust me. I'm for them, not against them. I'm working all these things out to get them free. Father, thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. And we walk out of here today energized, changed, transformed, and enlightened and ready to see a world that we can pass on to our children, our grandchildren, that they don't have to fight the battles that we fight. They won't have to face the mountains that we face. They'll be able to conquer and live as more than conquerors with their own world of influence in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you Wednesday night.